microscope because I can't see anybody. So got there it. it is. I just got it. As soon as you said that this morning, you saved the day. <laughs> we are recording. Thank you. Okay, sweet. Well, class again. So everybody, media arts writing class. Um, Meg and Dan, this is both. This is our Griffin at this point. So these are all basically our staff writers. They serve as staff writers, editors. Some of them do photography also. And everybody, so this is Meg and Dan, who both work for the Inquirer. Meg, and I just uh, read about this actually, that was named one of the top 30 female photographers in, in the world, right? It was in 2018 that you were named that honor, Meg? Yes, I was, thank you. <laughs> that was really awesome to hear. And they both are Pulitzer Prize winning reporters for what they covered when they covered the heroin epidemic, which some of you might have seen in the past in the class. And so, yes, two very high profile journalists that we have in here. And so, kind of going to give them the mic and give them the table, and they're going to lead a little uh, reporting and writing workshop with you guys and just teach you the process of pitching all the way to how a story comes about, especially when they work for a paper like The Inquirer. And so, and Dan also, like I mentioned to you all, was the narrator on the piece that we just watched 2020, the year that revealed us. And so that was his voice that you heard popping in here and there to eloquently narrate everything happening. And so. I was like the fifth choice for that. So it don't <laughs> sound like it. <laughs> okay, he was our first choice, but uh, <laughs> Dan's just going to be him down. But uh, yeah, I think this is this is wonderful um, to have this opportunity to talk to you guys. I know we were in the classroom um, last year, uh, last fall, I believe. And I think it'll be really great for us. We wanted to talk about the reporting and pitching and writing process with another story example. And then we can talk about the documentary and talk about some other things that we do. We'd love for you guys to be asking as many questions, you know, we want this to be really helpful for you guys. So um, I guess, Dan, should we just start with the uh, eviction story and rental story and kind of talk about how that came out. And this is kind of a classic journalism piece that I would, I would say. Um, and we wanted to talk to you guys, like, what does it look like to have an idea, something that you want to write about or you want to investigate? And what does that process look like to take it from idea to actually published? Um, so I don't know if you want to start, Dan, because you were actually the one that pitched this whole thing. <laughs> sure. I'll start by apologizing if my dog starts barking. He's He's an idiot, and he's not going to stop. So, <laughs> yeah, I throw it to throw it to Meg. Okay. Um, yeah, we um, and I want to repeat what Meg said too. It, we want this to be helpful to you guys. So, anytime you have questions or you want to steer us in a different direction, please do that because I, you know, I remember when I was a student, and a lot of times journalists come in and talk, and it might be interesting or or not, but um, <laughs> it wasn't helpful because we weren't talking about things that were relevant to what they were doing. So, we want to focus on your questions too. So, um, but we picked the eviction story to talk about because even though that story took several months of work on and off to, to happen, um, it's not the kind of story that any journalists, including you guys are gonna do on a regular basis because it was very involved and we used a lot of different tools. We wanted to talk about it because we used a lot of these different tools that you, you will use and any journalist will use um, in any story they work on. Um, you know, this story involved um, a lot of reporting, a lot of writing tools um, we used um, for it started with an idea and a lot of research uh, that came from beat reporting. Um, you know, I've covered the city and the county and courts and Meg has been in town her whole life and shooting folks all over town. Um, so we were familiar with the issue. Uh, we knew it was a problem. So the first step as a reporter is if you know that there's an, an issue or a potential problem here, find out if your hunch is right. So the first thing you do is you start asking people you know from your from your beats. You know, is this what I think it is? Is this the problem I think it is? And if it is a problem, how big a problem is it? And um, you know, what we found was uh, the answer is yeah. So we to to get to there, we had to talk to people who are in the court system. My dog is loving this. Yeah. <laughs> the court system um and i spent a lot of time going through census data um looking at um numbers for rental rental housing and income and how many people in our particular area uh were considered high risk for eviction based on their income and how much they pay for rent uh what we learned was cincinnati is one of the biggest renter cities in america 
It's right up there with San Francisco and New York and Miami and these big coastal cities. Uh, it's also a lousy city to rent in because it is a low income city. And so you have a combination of a lot of people rent and a lot of people struggle to pay the rent. So what we found from that was is that told us that our hunch was right, that there's a story here. Um, and then from there, we start the reporting process and we figure out we got to talk to people in the courts. We got to talk to people who, um, uh, who deal with us every day uh, in, in housing court. Uh, and we got to find people who are struggling. I had some sources at Legal Aid I've worked with in the past. And the way we found Paige Berry was I called Nick, the lawyer in the story, and said, you know, I need somebody who I can really spend some time with to help us tell this story. And so he kicked it around for a week or so, called me back and said, I think I got somebody. And, and that's how this usually works. If you, you know, you just, you got to be patient and ask the right people the right questions. And they found a good person for us. And then Meg and I went out and talked to her, spent some time with her. And then we did that again and again and again. And yeah. she was perfect for the story. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have to go back out and try again and again. Uh, in her case, it was pretty obvious very early on. She was very representative of what we wanted to look for. Um, you know, we wanted to find someone who represented these thousands of people in town who struggle with the rent. Um, someone who had just got out of jail, not somebody who, um, you know, had all kinds of other issues. Not that that's not, those aren't good stories or relevant stories, but that's not the story we're trying to tell here. We wanted to kind of focus on someone who represents a lot of people in town. And she, she did that. And I think it's so important to note that when you are telling these stories and investigations are really, they can be really heavy with numbers and what people connect with are other people. So that was so important for Dan and I to find the right person who people could empathize with and understand a little bit more of what she is going through or her family is going through, and then in turn understand what other families are going through. And so that was something that was so important. And when we are doing these stories is there are a lot of big findings and it's hard to sometimes make those connections to what your neighbor is going through. And so when we found Paige and her absolutely adorable daughters, um, we were so excited. and. It started off with us meeting her in a conference room, and then we had to build up trust, and we had we had to have her, you know, trust us to come into her home because that's where this is where the visuals come in. I want to tell the story that people can connect with, and they, I do that with photos and video, and so I can't do that in a conference room. I wanted to do that in her home as she was making dinner for her daughters or as she's driving uh, her daughters to school. So that's where it takes a lot of time. And that's where, as Dan and I have been in this community for a long time and have worked for this paper, we have built up a lot of trust. And as Dan is able to call his connection at legal aid, if he, you know, someone calling out of the blue and like, oh, I need this person, they wouldn't be as eager to help because we have a little bit of a, we have these connections. So that that's what's so important as you know, as you're reporting on your own school or even in your own neighborhood, is that you do have those connections and people can trust you and they respect you. Um, and that was so important for this for this story and trying to tell the story also visually of you know seeing these moments that people might not see and waking up really early as she's driving her girls to work. I mean, driving her girls to school after getting off of work. Paige works overnight um, so she can spend as much time with her daughters. And that was so important for us to show that, um, show those sacrifices and show like she's really tired <laughs> and she's trying to do all of this work. And it took us a few times of going there and spending time. And I'm really big on not always having my camera up and making sure that they connect with me as a person. And Dan, you know, doesn't always have his notebook out writing. It's a lot of them seeing who we are. And we had a lot of fun with the little girls and they had a very cute little cat. Ugh. Yeah, we, we had a lot of fun with that. But um, from there, sorry, Dan, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I had to step in with visuals a little bit no you're fine that's i'm glad you did because you know the, the other thing that's important to know is when you're doing a story like this 
the reporter and the photographer and the videographer have to work really closely together. And you have to be on the same page. You have to know when to step back and let the other person do their thing. Um, when you can make it work together or point out, hey, you know, you might want to check this out. Or so what so she mentioned this when I was talking to her, you might want to, you know, follow up on that. Um, so that's a huge part of, of any story like this is working closely together. And the only other thing I wanted to say about the story as it came together with visuals and uh, video photos and, and, and the written word is that, you know, it, it, I think it initially you read it and it comes across as a feature story, but there is a ton of reporting research and data that went into that story. And we, I, I was adamant with my boss. I did not want to turn this into a story about, Oh, Cincinnati is a renter city. And a lot of people here are poor. You know, we wanted to use that as the baseline for what the story was, but a ton of work went into establishing the premise of the story and making sure we were right before we went out and found someone who represented that. Because you can always find somebody who represents something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's representative of what's really going on in your community. So we knew not only was she an interesting person to, to follow and, and, and to have her tell her story, but she also represented something that was going on and by our count, about 90,000 other households in the city. Um, and that was really important. And so I guess, you know, and then this does involve all kinds of stuff in one story. You don't normally get that in one story. And I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed by that. But the point generally of this that Megan and I wanted to talk about this story was that you know, all of these tools are available to you for short-term stories, daily stories, short enterprise stories, if you're doing a piece on poverty in the neighborhood, there's census tract data about poverty in the neighborhood. If, if you, you know, if you want to talk to somebody about housing, there's people in the community to talk to about housing. You know, there's, you know, there's reporting that you can do, data that you can find, um, you know, and the interviewing approach that we took can apply to any of the stories that you do any day of the week and not just big projects. So that's, that's my bit. Maybe, maybe I want to talk a little bit more about photo, I think. Yeah, and I, I think it's so important when you, and this has been the really fun thing about working for a newspaper in the last few years where the possibilities of having your story go in a lot of different directions, the way you present it, where you can, you know, this is a great time for photojournalists because I can produce videos that are going to be seen by people. And I, I still get asked by some readers like, why are you producing videos? It's a newspaper. And it's like, well, we have this whole online thing and it's wonderful. Um, and that's what I really love is trying to come up with new ways to tell these stories that people can engage with. And with Instagram and TikTok, we are telling stories on TikTok, which is crazy to me with USA Today. And how can you tell a story in a shorter period of time? How can you connect with people? And what I have found and I think this is universally true, is if it's a good story, people are going to read it. People are going to watch it. And it really doesn't, we try and do all these different tricks and use all these different tools in our toolbox to have the stories connect with people or find people where they're at. But every story that I've worked on that has been a good story has been really well engaged with. And so that's really encouraging to me um, as we're trying to find new ways to tell these stories. It's just, you know, we can tell it in a new way. We can tell it, we can tell it with video. We could tell it with a podcast. And so there's a lot of possibilities right now as a journalist, as, you know, online journalist, print journalist, we, we've got a lot of freedom in trying to explore what that looks like. Um, and I know like that's, I've talked to a lot of students and they're like, well, what is, what is the future of newspapers? What is the future of, you know, photojournalism? And it's, you know, you have to have a lot of different skills. And as Dan learned and I learned, cause we produced, you know, this is my first documentary this past fall and Dan learned how to be a screenwriter. And that's so important as you are becoming a journalist is there's so many new ways that we can be doing this work. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of uh, Dan. <laughs> I'm passing it back to you. <laughs> well, no, I mean I'm I'm a little bit older than Meg, um, so it, a lot of this is is basically graduated the same time. A lot more uh, uh, adapting by me um, because I I didn't enter this business with online was not a thing when I started 
doing journalism. You know, we didn't have to do uh, the kind of work we do now. We didn't produce videos. We um, we didn't do documentaries. We didn't do any of the stuff that we're doing now. And and you know, I think we're uh, Meg and I, and I think a lot of other reporters at the Inquirer and elsewhere are, are trying to embrace the chaos a little bit at this time because things are crazy in our business. Um, not always good crazy, but um, there are opportunities there to learn and to do things that you haven't done before and to tell stories in ways that you haven't told them before. And um, I think for young journalists, especially, that's pretty exciting because you can try different things. You can try different formats. You can try different platforms. Um, and, you know, that wasn't there when I came out. When I came out, you wrote a story and photographers took pictures and copy editors read your story. We used to have copy editors who actually read our stories. Um, and that was it. You know, and now, you know, we've got to think about all these other things about how we engage with people. And it can be a real pain sometimes, but it can also be uh, really interesting and we can learn a lot from it. And, and a lot of you guys, you're growing up with this stuff and, you know, it's going to be second nature for you guys to think about telling stories in some of these ways. And don't be afraid to try that. But, you know, always think about it as a journalist, too. And you still have to tell a story. You still have to tell stuff that, um, you know, is fair and in the proper context and makes sense. But uh, that doesn't mean you can't use some of the tools that you use every day in your lives to do that. And um, I think you guys are really well positioned to, to do that as you uh, you get out into the business. And there's so many different types of stories that Dan and I work on. And there's so many ways that like for a breaking news story, um, we've been, Dan and I covered the protests this past summer and Dan is out there tweeting and it's trying to get information to people really quickly he's sending videos he's writing and his tweets are so his tweets are informative even those ways that you wouldn't think that that's that's a work that's, that's journalism and you know i've done live streaming from protests from breaking news situations there's so many ways that we have to be really engaging with our audience and while the renter story took a few months to come together we have other stories that something, a story might break and we had to report on it quickly. And so we have to, we have to get a quick photo. We have to have really strong um, information. We have to have it all sourced. And that's why it's so important that whether you have a few months, a year or a few hours, you have to go through those same pro the same process, um, all those different steps. and. I think it's just really, it's been really interesting to see as our news cycle has just been unrelenting and things have been changing back and forth. You can't wait on a lot of things. So we've had to be really quick and have to have really adapt to that fast paced um, storytelling. Yeah, I mean, at the protest, you know, we're I was Facebook live and we were getting tear gassed. I was tweeting throughout the day. We had other short videos that we were putting up. Um, Meg was shooting and posting video. Um, you know, then we had to write a story about it when you're done, um, piecing a lot of that together. Um, you call stuff in sometimes or people just follow your tweet. I mean, we use Twitter to inform our readers, but also to <laughs> just, just ads for our stories as someone back in the office is dropping into a story somewhere. So. Um, a lot of this stuff is uh, just a different way to do the kind of work journalists have been doing for a long time. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, do you guys have any questions about any of this stuff? Because we do want to be helpful to you guys. If, if there's stuff you're working on you, um, that relates to any of this, or if you have questions about stuff that we've done, um, you know, we just want to try to tell you something that might be useful for you in your, in, in your work. Yeah, thank you both so much. I already do see some hands raised, so get ready. You're going to probably get a whole bunch, and so this is good. Uh, Drea, I saw yours first, so if you want to go for it, go for it. Okay. When you're like, um, because you said you did like voiceovers or whatever, or like when you're filming a video or something like that and you're talking, do you ever feel awkward like you're talking to yourself? <laughs> Constantly. <laughs> I will just say, because Dan's going to have an awkward answer to this, he was so good. Um, we actually have a podcast booth at the Enquirer. So we all went in and we were all like masked up. We put Dan in a little booth <laughs> um, and 
I mean, he might have felt awkward, but he sounded so good. And I will say, because I had to record the first, I did the narration, like the, we call it like the dummy text. It was just to like put it in to get our timing down. And I recorded it in my closet, like on Thanksgiving, which was kind of sad. But uh, I was so refreshed to not hear my voice with the video. So, because it's a very awkward thing to be doing a voiceover. I, um, yeah. But Dan, Dan the natural. Yeah. Now I I'd written for video before. I've never narrated before. Um, so that was new. Um, but you know, it was it was a good experience to just it's a totally different thing. You have to, you know, you write the words and you have a cadence in your head about how they should be, but then you have to look at the video and how they fit in the video. And sometimes that's not the way you thought it would be when wrote it and that's when Meg says no we have to try that again because it didn't fit there or we have to break it here because it doesn't mesh up with the video and uh, it was fascinating I mean I learned a lot and um, you know I'm an old man and I'm still learning stuff so it was a good experience um, but yeah it is very awkward to hear your voice especially you have earphones on and you can hear yourself in your own head which no one really needs um, so especially my head so <laughs> Yeah. The short answer is, yeah, it was awkward, but it, it was a good learning experience. Lamont had a question. Lamont? Lamont? What happened? Wait, what happened? You raised your hand for a question. Did you still have it? <laughs> uh, oh yeah my question was like when doing like because i know not all reporting stories but like um uplifting ambiable and cheering and all that but like when you do like the sad story and try to grab their attention like what like how do you try to best like think like the best way to sympathize like put empathy into your stories without trying to make it seem like it's too bland and it's not enough emotion there. Hmm. Well, I, I think it's important when you're dealing with anyone, anyone you're interviewing, whatever the story, that you don't patronize them, you don't condescend, you know, you're just honest about why you're there. Uh, I'm not there to give them hugs and to talk them through a tough time. I mean, I, I'm there to, you know, be the eyes and ears of our readers and to report on what's going on in their lives. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't be empathetic. It doesn't mean you can't be decent. And it doesn't certainly mean you can't be fair to them. And so I always tell people, you know, I'm, you know, not here to make you look bad or anything, but I do want to be honest with people. It's, you know, I have to be honest about what's going on in your life. And um, I think, and then over time, they get that you mean it, you know, it's, not, it's easy to say, but I think when you spend more time with people, and in the case of Paige Berry, we spent a lot of time with her. I think she became very at ease with us and her kids. And and so it became much more natural that, you know, we were just there and we were watching their lives unfold, which is what we really wanted. Um, but then when it comes time to write the story, you know, you do have, you know, we're there in their homes and you see things and hear things and it's very personal. And, you know, we're not going to use everything. Um, so we'll, I think what we try to do is we focus on what's relevant. Um, what can we do? Um, that keeps things in a proper context. So we're honest with our readers. Um, and, you know, what can we do, you know, to make sure that we're not, you know, you just, you don't want to, you know, be condescending to people. You don't want to put stuff that's just gratuitous in there. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to sugarcoat things. And so you, you walk that fine line of, you know, what do we need to tell our story? What do we need from their lives to tell our story without going overboard? And I think with Paige, you know, you see, if you guys read the story, I mean, there's some tough stuff in there about her early days, you know, her conversation with her mom. I thought it was important just to just include that. Her mom said, you know, if you're going to pretend to be an adult and have babies and you're going to be on your own. And that was a, a tough moment for Paige. And I think it was, it kind of woke her up. And it, I think it, it was important to include it because, you know, she, she, from that point on, she worked, she, she supported her family she raised her kids. Um, she had to live in public housing for a while and she, you know, it was in a, a bad place for a while and there, were, you know, she got herself out of it. Um, 
you know, all of that was relevant to the story. It was some of it was hard stuff that, you know, Paige probably wouldn't share with in under normal circumstances, but it was mm -hmm. the story. So, I mean, I guess that's, you know, you, you get their trust by showing them that you're going to be do it right by them. Um, and then at, when it comes time to write the story, you just have to be fair as fair as you can be and still be honest with, with the readers. And I, I, I think that's such a great question for, um, I ever okay. I'm just seeing this other question of do I ever take pictures? Um, I'm sorry, um, as like emotions. Um, and I'm gonna answer that and Lamont's question because this is something I still struggle with, and I've been doing this for a few years. Is photographing people in pain, photographing people that are struggling and crying and. Um, fortunately, I usually have Dan <laughs> for these heavier projects, and you know, I, I will click the camera, I'll make the sh the shutter will make it sound, and I'm like, oh god, it sounds so loud. And people understand when you spend that time with them, like what you're there to do. And Dan and I have to be very direct with people and be honest with what we are doing. I don't want to show people an unflattering light. I don't want to show them in a way that's not representative of their experience. But, you know, there's a lot of hard stuff in life. And it is a way for people, other people to understand and empathize is to see it and to read about it. Um, I photographed, Dan and I worked on the story last year. And um, this was not like a very emotional situation, but we were uh, photographing a high school baseball team. And everything was really happy and things were good. And then one of their first basemen, um, Hot Pot, he got out of the game. And he starts getting really upset. His coach is yelling and screaming at him in the dugout. And it was such a key moment of what was happening. And I struggled so hard to take that picture. And I looked at Dan, Dan's like, you gotta give me the nod of my <laughs> Take it, but it's it's hard, and but that picture, it was a great picture too. It was, it was a great, great photo, and it was something that was so true. And when you kind of do this, when you spend a lot of time with people, they kind of forget you're there, and then you get more of this real. Um, it, things just feel a lot more real, and because I think whenever I take a picture, um, when I meet someone, everyone's like, "Okay, I'm smiling. Okay, I'm up," and. Um, with the with more time you spend with them, there's less of that facade, and then you get to see like the realness. And I think um, that was a really, that was a great lesson, especially with the baseball team. They definitely forgot, forgot we were in the dugout, definitely. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think too, you know, it's important, especially today, and especially for young journalists to to think about this: that your job is not to be a social worker. You know, our job in going to these situations is not to get Paige Berry help with her rent. Um, you know, as much as we want her to have help with her rent and as much as we like her, it's not our job to be a, her advocate in that way. It's not our job to make sure that she secures, um, you know, help from legal aid or from the courts. Um, now, as a result of our story, people might respond in that way, and that's fine. But you know, we don't and can't go into a story thinking, I'm going to help that person. You know, we might personally want to, um, and, and maybe we personally hope that happens, but that's, you, you can't go into a story thinking that way because you, first of all, you never know how people are going to receive a story. It may not, it may go sideways and, and it, something completely different happens. And we don't know these people the way we know our own family. We don't know what else is going on in their lives. So it's just, I guess, there's a lot of advocacy out there today. There's a lot of people on social media who talk about pro this, pro anti that. It's not the job of journalists to do that. It's the job of the journalist to kind of shine the light on what's going on and just step back and then let people respond the way they want to respond. And um, I think that's something that young journalists, especially, and, and frankly, you know, veteran journalists need to hear more often because it, it, I think too often we get our roles confused. Yeah, and I will say as a also with the Paige Berry story that you know we put the story out there, it, a lot of readers responded, and you know while we didn't have any hand in this, a lot of people sent gift cards and money to Paige, and I think that's that's a really cool thing about journalism is that you can have this impact and you can 
you know, there was an impact of people moving and inspiring them to do something, but that's not something that Dan and I asked for. It's not something that we've called out to do. It is something that when we have written stories in the past that people have wanted to help. And um, it's just, it's a, it's a nice perk of that. Um, I don't think I answered Michael's question. So I'm just gonna read this all out and then I'll answer it properly. Do you ever think of taking pictures as like emotions, like something bad happens. So you take a few pictures of areas um, around it and you show them, show the pictures for the emotions so that the, the pictures are more emotional than informative. And absolutely, I, I do this. Um, I try to do this. Um, I think people really connect with emotion and connect with feeling. I had a professor once tell me that your picture should be an adjective and not a noun. And I thought, or a verb, where it's not someone doing something. It's not someone swimming. It's not someone, not someone driving their car. But if the picture can feel like something, it can feel, um, those were really bad examples for feelings, but um, if it's, you know, something where you can connect with them, we call that like process photojournalism, like process photography, where it's just, okay, so-and-so is moving this box to here, or so-and-so is teaching the class, but to incorporate more emotions. And that's why we try and photograph a lot of moments that hint, that get more at the emotion of people being really happy or sad. And those are the photos that you best connect with. And I think that emotions can be more informative than simply a picture of just a surrounding in an area. Um, and that has to do with a lot of, you know, the people you're photographing, the light, the, I mean, the light is huge. Um, you can photograph something right now where it's cloudy and overcast, and then it's just kind of blah. But if you photograph the same scene in a few hours when the sun is setting, you get this golden light. It gives it a whole different feeling and different emotion. So there's a lot of things to consider with that, but I think emotions can be very informative in photographing them. I know we have a hand in the yeah, Nina, I didn't see your hand, so you can go ahead and uh, shoot your question next. I was going to ask, how do I interview people without it being like awkward and feeling weird? Because like, I already feel awkward when I'm talking to people like in everyday life, but like I feel like when I'm interviewing people, it's more so good. like it's just, that's my dog, sorry. But how do I do that? Well, it's um, it's completely normal, um, I, and I will tell you, it does get better the, the longer you do the job. Um, you know, and you'd be surprised how many people who are really introverts go into this business, which is weird and counterintuitive, but it's true. You get a lot of people who are curious about a lot of things and think about a lot of things like that, but they they aren't gregarious, outgoing people. Um, so that's a very common thing for re reporters, actually. Um, but it does it does get better with time and practice. I think um, one thing I found that helps is be prepared um, anytime you're doing any kind of public speaking. But if you're going to do an interview, I think the best thing is to prepare as best you can for that interview. And that doesn't mean writing a big script or anything. Um, but what I often do, um, even today, is I'll write out just a, a checklist of things that I want to make sure I talk about with that person. Um, understanding that I'm going to chase them down rabbit holes if they say something interesting, but um, I, I'm going to let them drive a lot of this interview, but I'm also going to direct them to the things that I know I have to cover. Um, and I think that takes a lot of anxiety out of it for me, especially if it's someone who, if it's a really important interview or it's someone who maybe you find intimidating in some way, um, it's, it's always helpful to be prepared to, to talk about something. If you, if you, you should know that you know, this is your job, this is my interview, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get asked my questions. And I think being prepared gives you a little more confidence when you do that. And it keeps you on track when things get a little weird. If someone says, screw you, I don't want to answer that question. Like, all right, you know, you're ready to move on to another question or to ask it in a different way. Um, you know, and, you know, that kind of thing happens. Some people don't want to talk very much. Um, 
And so it just, it, it depends. And as the interview goes on, you get a feel for that person and how you might ask those questions. But, uh, but yeah, I think the, the best thing to do to help ease that anxiety is to be as prepared as you can be. And I, I think on top of that, because I will always write down some questions and I notice, like at the end of interviews that I find really successful is that we hit on those things, but we go in so many new directions and it's really important to be an active listener. And as you're listening and you're hearing what they're saying, instead of just being like, okay, I want to go through this question and this question, you know, follow some of those rabbit holes. And I, I think that's really important to, you know, keep that engagement um, with the person you're interviewing. I like to record um, my interviews. Um, as I mostly do video interviews, so it really helps me to remember exactly what was said. Um, and it kind of gives you a little bit more confidence when you are writing your story or to be like, okay, that was the exact quote. Um, but I still get nervous when I do interviews. Um, I'm more comfortable if I'm going into someone's home and being able to talk to them. But I interviewed uh, Governor DeWine and Governor Bashir for the documentary. And I called Dan before and I was so nervous. I was so sweaty and I'm like, okay, <laughs> we will get through it. And it was just after asking a couple questions, I felt comfortable and relaxed, but it's something that you get better at, but it's still, it can be nerve wracking. Great question. Love yeah. all these so much, you guys, Amy. This is good. And then let's go for uh, Monty. I do see a hand up, but Ashley, I do see one that you typed into the chat that I'll do real quick. And I think you both touched on this talking about Paige and the eviction story a whole lot, but it's just simply, do you ever get attached to a story when you're writing it? So the people you're talking about. And all of that. I, I absolutely do. Um, I think when you are spending a lot of time with people, it's so um, it's hard not to. I stay in contact with a lot of people. Um, I did a story six years ago, and I, I still talk to the family um, pretty regularly, but I can't, it's impossible to do that for every story. And so for saying it's hard, we have to set some boundaries with people. Because um, I have worked on pieces where I'm over at someone's house a couple times a week for a year, and then we stop going. And that's a really hard, you know, cutoff point. So I've had to work on kind of establishing those boundaries because you can get attached to people really quickly, and um, they can get attached to you. And it's okay to like the people or to not like the people you you're writing about. I mean, that's, you're human and that's okay. This is the important thing that I always tell myself when I'm reporting and writing is I ha I need to be fair. I need to tell their stories in the proper context. And of course you need to be right. You need to be accurate. But, um, you know, I, I've all, I've told classes before, you know, you can also be really accurate and also not fair. I mean, it, it, you, context really matters. You, you, you need to look at the big picture if you take something out of context, say, well, that's accurate, but um, it's not fair to that person, whether I like them or not. And so you have to put the work in to understanding the totality of the story and to ask yourself, you know, is this a fair thing to do? Is this a fair way to present the story? Um, but yeah, in the course of doing those stories, you do, you, you know, you get attached to the person in some way because they're a part of your life for sometimes a couple months. I mean, you know, you get to know them. Um, you might be rooting for them. Um, you know, I, I, Meg and I didn't do this story together, but I followed a, a foster kid for a year when she was in her last year of high school living on her own. Um, and, you know, there are like 50 kids um, in the Hamilton County every year or so who as they exit foster care are basically on their own. They're, they're not, they were never adopted. Um, and so they get an apartment on their own at 17. And we just thought it'd be interesting. What is that like? And so we followed her for a year and we got attached to her, you know, I mean, she's a good kid. She had a lot of issues. Um, and that was a tough one when you talk about trying to tell stuff in proper context and stuff, because you don't, you know, you want to be fair to the reader and to her, but I mean, you know, when you do those kinds of stories, you do get attached to, to people um, for good or ill sometimes. Mm -hmm. Another good one, Ashley. Thank you so much for that. And I do see Monty, I've seen your hand up. Um, so let's hear it. 
Okay. I have two questions, but I'm going to ask one because I got to go in a minute. But the one I'm going to ask is... Um, I'm going to ask, on a scale of 1 through 10, what is the ideal level when being when being unbiased about stories? Like, what would you range yourself? Being unbiased? That, like, um, you, know, you know how, like, on a story, like, you can't be too um, opinionated about it. About sure. it. Like, we got to have some some factual and not all about you, like, your feelings and stuff. Honestly, like, one through ten, like, what is the ideal level of being unbiased? Well, I think, I, I don't know if I put it on a scale because, I mean, we all have our biases. And this is a conversation journalists have all the time and, and need to have with the public, too is we are human, we have biases, we see things, frankly, journalists are in the thick of a lot of this stuff more than most people on a daily basis. So we have opinions about all kinds of stuff. Um, so being un unbiased doesn't mean you don't have opinions or you don't have your own feelings. Um, I think the best answer I can give is that you try to recognize what your own biases may be and um, push against that when you have to, when you're doing a story. And I try hard to go into every story with an open mind about where it might go. Um, and, and and I like, I think this goes back to what I said before, that I go into a story not with an agenda, not with to be a social worker or to fix some ill, um, you know. And so I, I think that help, if you do, do approach a story that way, I think it forces you to think about all the other um, points of play and all the different ways a story could be told. Um, so that's kind of the way I, I look at it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that journalists don't have their own opinions and their own biases. We all do. Um, but I think that's at, part of your job um, is not to be some pure soul, but to just, you know, recognize what they are and to, to deal with that and confront that every time you sit down to write a story. I, yeah, I think that's a great question and something that we've had a lot of conversations about, especially in the last year. Um, I think there's a lot of bias in like when it comes to what stories journalists actually pick and what not pick, but what stories we are telling what's in the newspaper. And that has to do a lot about representation within the newsroom. You know, what backgrounds are um, are the reporters coming from faith based, you know, are I mean, it's just, it's really interesting and it's something that our newsroom has worked really hard to have better representation and better diversity. And it changes what the paper, what the stories look like. It changes what we're reporting on. And that's something that a lot of newsrooms across the country are working on. Um, I just, I think that's, I think that's a really good question and something that we didn't talk about when I was in college. We didn't talk about that when I was studying journalism, and that was not that long ago. So I think that's a really good, um, I think that's one of the big things I'm proud of, that we are moving towards um, better representation and hopefully uh, more stories that are representative of our community. <laughs> Thanks, Monty, for saying that. Thanks for asking that, too. And those of you that are staying on, I really appreciate all of you a whole lot. Um, I think Carlissa does have a good one, and I, yeah, this usually does get asked one way or another. It's if you two could change one thing and only one thing about your work and how you do it now, um, what would it be and why? Ooh. <laughs> about a particular piece of work or all of our work? <laughs> I like our work as journalists? Yeah, okay, our work is, what would be one thing that we would change, Dan, about our work as journalists? That's a hard question. I'm, I mean, there's a lot of things about journalism. You know, we're going, the, the business is going through a hard time. So, I mean, the big picture answer is I'd love for there to be more of us. <laughs> and I'd love for us to have more resources than we do. Um, that would be nice. Um, I think, I mean, you know, I, I look back on everything I write, everything I do, and think I wish I'd done that a little different, I'd done that a little better. You know, I think most people are like that. Um, but I think big picture, I, I, I think it would be nice if we had more resources than we have. Um, I guess that's not really the personal answer you might be looking for. Um, 
that's kind of where I'm at though, Dan. I think the resources and I, um, but I think there needs to be a better understanding of what journalists actually do and what a newspaper journalist does. And that's something that we have really, uh, has been very glaring in the last uh, four years. Um, but I think that's something that we struggle with. Uh, even when I'm in the community and some people will come up to me and say, oh, you're fake news. And it's like, actually, can we have a conversation? Let's have a conversation about that. Why, why do you say that? Why do you think that? And so in addition to resources, I know this is more than one thing, but it's hypothetical. I, I would like for that better understanding because I think if there was a better understanding of what journalists do and our role in the community, I think we'd have more support and resources from that community. I, th I think that's very fair. I th and that, that may be the answer. Personally, I think looking back, maybe do a better job explaining what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think we've kind of been compelled to do that more in the last few years, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of confusion about what the media is. And um, that's a whole nother hour conversation we want to get into. But, but I think, um, you know, it, it, there's value in just explaining who you are and what you do and why you do it and, and how we do our jobs and how we're different from what, you know the guys yelling at each other on cable news every night are i mean that's not what that's not what we do people assume that's the media um and you're just like that and you know i i don't do what jake tapper does and i, I don't do what sean hannity does and they don't do what i do um you know it's not a value judgment they just you know they're pundits and columnists and you know they have they they're paid to have opinions yeah um, so i think there is value in that and that that may be the uh, the thing that maybe looking back we should have done better um over time and that we still need to get better at and it's just such a simple like just a simple thing that we've changed is so we have editorials which are op opinion columns where people can write in and they can you know express their opinion we even have an editorial board who says this is the right decision this is the wrong decision and it's very separate from our newsroom but it's coming on the same pages it's pr printed in the same way so we've had to do things where it's like opinion oh, this is the opinion and still people are it's so confusing to people and i think in a you know, in a world where my facebook post is the same you know takes up the same real estate on facebook as my aunts or the Cincinnati inquires there's a lot of there's a lot of um yelling and a lot of chatter and it's like well what's what's the truth and what's not um and i think if we were able to explain a little bit more of like what we do and the fact-based journalism that we subscribe to <laughs> um i think it would be better for us in the long run I think, thank you both for answering that too. That's a, yeah, appreciate that a whole lot. I think like every time there's a chance for the walls to come down between the people and you, your work is when that relationship is so strong. And I feel like the inquiry, even you just speaking to students like this and the ways that you both give back to students, giving them an understanding to see the behind the scenes stuff that isn't always seen is so huge. And even just explaining to them like the amount of work that you both clearly put into that documentary or any long form story like that. I think a lot of people just, they see the words and they just think, oh, that's just something that was put together in a couple of days. No, this takes like 25 reporters, I think I read, and yeah. like sweat and tears and months of research, interviews and all that. And I think the more people understand the amount of work that you all do to put up what people see, the more those walls come down, the more people are like, oh, okay, yeah, and then it clicks. Absolutely. I, I think that's so important for us to to peel back that layer because, you know, we're in this community as much as anyone else. And I think it's so important that, like, we're the same people you're, you know, grocery shopping with. We're the same people that you go to church with. And I think for people to understand that level of work and also understand our accountability to this community, um, we're not, we don't work for the New York Times or Washington Post and what we call is parachute journalism where you drop in and then leave. Um, I, I think it's so important that that's, you know, part of our commitment and also doing this in-depth work that, you know, for Dan to be reading census data, which just sounds like so much fun, <laughs> you know, it takes, it takes days, it takes weeks to sort through that. And it might be one sentence in a story. So, so important.
Oh, I just see. Uh, has COVID actually benefited your work in any way at all? <laughs> I don't think I'd use the word benefit. <laughs> no. It's changed a lot of the way we work. I mean, just physically changed it. Um, yeah. I, that, that's, a, that's, that's a really good question. I think um, early on, uh, our stories about COVID were read more than any other thing we've ever done because people were so hungry for information. And so like, you know, you think about it, it's like you, we had to explain what is coronavirus. We had to explain what safety precautions, where do you get tested? while things were being rolled out. So it really showed like how important it was for journalists in the community to be pointing these things out. And people want information. Um, we, we had to have it. And I think that was so important. It definitely changed the way we worked, but um, I, I would not be benefited um, because COVID has not, um, has had a lot of personal effects on us. Um, you know, we've had people that have, have died. We have had people that have been sick. Some of our staffers have been sick. We've been furloughed, which means that we weren't, you know, we had to not work because we didn't have enough money um, as a company. They're trying to save money. So, um, I, yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, I would not say benefited, but Dan, you probably have other things. No, I think you're kind of, I mean, it's changed, it's changed the way we work and, and complicated it in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it's always easier to be in a room together where you can just walk over to somebody's desk and have a conversation. Um, you know, it's changed the way we interview people. We have to mask up if we're going anywhere near, you know, in close quarters that we have to arrange to be outdoors if we can. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's, stopped us from doing any stories that we would have otherwise done, but it has definitely changed the way we go about doing them. Yeah. And as you guys saw in the documentary where we had to get pretty creative in how we interviewed people. And, you know, my concern is if I'm going to tell a story, if I'm going to be in someone's house and I'm wearing two masks and then I come home and completely sanitize my car, my gear, I take a shower, all those things, because I want to keep my family safe. So there's a lot of it definitely has changed the way we worked, but we've had to get really creative and, you know, doing Zoom calls with people and having them film themselves if they are part of the documentary. So, um, yeah, I think that's the best way of saying it has definitely changed the way we work. And we've learned that there's a lot of things that we used to do that aren't going to be necessary if we ever get back into the newsroom, if there's a newsroom. <laughs> I'm working in a t-shirt and shorts today. So, you know, there's yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I still have my pajama pants on. That counts. That's all right. I put a sweater on for you guys. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, let me see if anyone else has anything to add. Those of you that just stayed and continued through your lunch, thank you all so much for doing that. I really appreciate that a whole lot. And um, again, like those of you, like Nina, Ashley, I see you on here, Michael and Lisa, if you want to grab lunch or whatever. And, um, you're totally welcome to do that if you want to sit in. But I think a good thing, even just for the recording, maybe to, to wrap up on is just basic tips that you would have for these high schoolers to just motivate them when we start another round of Griffin stories. And so just something they can do to, to either think about what can I write about to, uh, you know, when it comes to pitching the story or any tips when it comes to like, just where do I, you know, like, where do I start? Where am I going to get ideas? Um, what, what are good questions to ask yourself? to uh, figure out what I want to pitch, what I want to write about. I think that's a, it's, it's a hard thing to be like, okay, where do I start? But Dan um, said this earlier of like, you know, kind of following those curiosities, uh, things that you are wondering about, you know, how does this work? How does this, I, I love to drive around the city and this is like one of those big inspirations for me where I'll drive around and be like, ah, oh, I wonder where that building is from. I wonder how this fits to this. And just, I always keep a little notebook with me for ideas. And I also read a lot of other newspapers and I watch a lot of other videos that other newspapers do to help come up with ideas. I think about, okay, so if this is a national issue, how is this a local issue? How does this impact our community? And I think following some of those curiosities and 
start asking some questions about like things that you've always wondered about, it, I think it's a good place to start. Um, at least for me, that's something that I do and kind of have a running list. Um, I've had, I've been at the Enquirer for six years and I still have the same notebook with ideas and there's a lot of things I've been able to do and some things that I might get to do, but it's just kind of listing those down. has been really helpful for me. Dan has probably more practical advice. <laughs> no, I, I just say it's an extension of that is just listen, you know, what are people in school talking about? What are people in the neighborhood talking about? Um, you know, if it's interesting enough for kids and, and people in the neighborhood to have a conversation about it, it might be uh, it might be interesting to write about it. Um, what are they worried about? What are they um, what are they, you know what are they entertained by? What are they curious? About? You know, we if you look at our website any given day, you see all kinds of different stuff there. I mean, we had a story yesterday. They were just taking down the facade of an old store downtown, and they found this whole Victorian. Uh, new of a building that they didn't know was there. It had been covered for 70 years and um, people love that story. You know, it's just like, yeah. how, oh, what is that? Where did that come from? How long has it been there? Who built it? Why did it get covered up in the first place? Just that, that kind of stuff. I mean, you just never know. I mean, we had a, a, another report and I had a story today about Madisonville and some, you know, stuff going on up there. I thought it was pretty boring when we started and we started talking to some people and um, you know, people were really ticked off about some of the stuff that's going on in that community. And we dug in and dug in and it's the number one story on our site today because people were just really engaged with this story. And it, it, it's about development and gentrification, a lot of issues, that a lot of neighborhoods deal with. So just pay attention, listen, mm -hmm. write down good ideas. If you hear one, if you're curious about it, ask questions, you know, start asking questions about stuff. Something you think may be nothing might turn out to be something. Um, you know, the truth is most stuff that you think might be a story is never a story, but, but you got to ask about it and you got to do some work about it, do a little research and, um, see where it leads you. And even just like a silly example of that, um, you just never know when something is going to be a story. And so why not pursue it or why not take a photo? What our, uh, director of photography was walking around downtown, uh, back in November and it was right after the Christmas tree was delivered to Fountain Square. And it was a very sad, sorry looking tree. And she took a picture of it and she put it on Twitter as just saying like, what's going on here? From there, we, have, we wrote stories about the tree. Um, it was on the Today Show. It was on the um, Jimmy Fallon. It was on Stephen Colbert. Uh, it actually, the tree got its own Twitter account and it was the silliest little thing, but it was one of those things that people were talking about it and it became a story. It became a very popular story. Um, granted, like, is this the best journalism? No, but this again, it's just something that people were talking about and it was, she was walking to get coffee and saw it. So we just never know where those little stories or, um, inspirations will come from. Uh, Turns out the tree was fine. They just needed to fluff it up a little bit. Yeah, a lot of fluffing. Another thing we learned, who knew they fluffed the Christmas tree? I didn't know they did that. So. Yeah. I am so glad you brought up the pre-fluffed Christmas tree. It gave me a lot of laughs back in November. So I was, yeah, that was a joy to hear all about, but man. Um, that's such a good thing. It's like what we do a lot of serious stuff. We do a lot of stories that are just they are hard for us to report and to have those little bright spots is really great. And that's something that I like to do is to find stories that make you happy to kind of balance out because it's it's hard to be a reporter. It's hard to be a photojournalist. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of good stories that need to be told that make people smile and make people happy and I think it's good to make sure you are doing those. It doesn't have to be, you know, corruption at City Hall, which there's a lot of, um, to make a good story. So let me keep that in mind. Well, thank you both so much for spending a full hour with us. This is huge. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, it just means a ton. And I know that they got, I'm excited to look back at their notes. We're going to discuss this in the next following days. So I'll follow up and let you guys know how that goes. But yeah, I won't be able to thank you enough for this. Seriously, it means a ton. No, thank you guys. It's been fun. Yeah, thank you so much.
So I'll go ahead and I'm going to stop the recording real fast after that to make it look all clean, everything perfect. Stop recording. And then hopefully it'll set.